What up, Wildcatters? Welcome back to another episode of the Willing Gas Service Podcast. We're here with a buddy, Mike. Mike Cantz, right? Lance. Lance. Yeah. Messed that one up. <laughs> so this is <laughs> okay. I think we have enough now where we can like make a bloopers reel of Jake yep. fucking up people's As, uh, names uh, on the uh, podcast uh, every time. <laughs> so go ahead and say the company name. So I'll probably fuck that up too. Is it Kairos? Kairos. Yeah. Kairos. Yeah. Kairos. You got it. Yeah. You're probably the first one to get it. How we at least pronounce it. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> cool. So what is what is Kairos? So our premise is uh, extending the life of existing unconventional wells. Um, through a uh, and and what we've developed is a, a rigless production enhancement process, um, and effectively what that means is we're utilizing different types of chemistry uh, to go in with no mechanical intervention. We're not pulling pumps. We're not uh, you know running coil in or anything. Uh, so we're using uh, different types of chemistry combined with different diversion processes to access uh, these long horizontals, clean up damage, enhance production. Um, and yeah. different types of mechanisms. Yeah, I mean, I think that this is probably starting to become a growing market now that you have a lot of these horizontals that um, you know, have had steep declines and they've leveled off a bit. You know, they're in you know five year uh, plus vintage, and so people are trying to have enhanced recovery in those. So, um, so chemical solution uh, doesn't require anything mechanical. Assuming you guys pump this pump this down and let it let it do its thing is that essentially how you deliver it yeah so you can think of it it's, it's effectively like a mini frack job okay. um but without without actually fracking without actually parting the, the uh, formation so okay um so yeah there are a couple usually a couple frack pumps um a blender and um okay and a data van and so so you just get a mini um, mini, mini pump skid out there frack yeah. skid out there yep. and um pump it down okay cool so we've had a few chemical solutions on the show uh it's previously yeah it's been a while um i'm trying to think of what all the applications were for those you know is this market is it is is it a growing market i mean are people really looking at chemical solutions uh for you know either enhanced recovery or just uh, more efficient production? I mean, is this something that a lot of uh, oil and gas companies are exploring right now? Or because I'm kind of going models. like based off trends off of our podcast, because mm -hmm. I remember we had a few few years ago and then it seemed like there was a break in that where yeah. we didn't have any on the show. Yeah. I don't know if that correlates with um, most trends EOR of, was, is traditionally vertical wells. And so I think it's very interesting that you guys are doing the horizontals. Yeah. So um, the, the true, what I'll call big EOR projects were vertical wells in your conventional reservoirs, right? Not mm -hmm. the tight shales. Um, I was seeing in kind of 19-ish when things were, um, you know, operators were tightening their belts ultimately right on the CapEx side, that there was starting to be some growing momentum of what are we going to do with all these existing laterals, right? So... From what I calculated, it's something like 90,000 of these horizontal wells have been drilled, you know, from the shale boom, right? Yeah. Uh, that are more than two years old. Yeah. So, um, so you had all those wells. And so, and then obviously COVID didn't help anything, right? 2020, nobody, nobody wanted to talk about more oil out of their wells. But as we came out of that, and that's when we started, um, was there is a, certainly a growing um, demand for what can we do with um, squeezing some more production out yeah. of these guys. And so, um, and so that's where, and the other thing is that, so I had a, a, a pretty long chemistry background and reservoir background. Yeah, so I was about to ask, what is, what is your background? So chemical engineer. Okay. Um, out of mines. And then, uh, but went right into like a reservoir role, um, out of service, always on the service side though, service and, you know, technology type companies. Yeah. So when did you get into the industry? 2008. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So, um, yeah, I, lo I love people like us that got into the industry around that time yeah. because right now I've been making fun of people on Twitter in the tech industry because it's their first downturn <laughs> yeah. and you know, this guy's falling. I'm like, man, you come over to oil and gas. We've had three cycles yeah, in our, yeah. in our career. Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah my yeah. whole career's been yeah. downturn. Yeah. You have a 12 year yeah. career, three cycles. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. No, it's been crazy. Right. Um, 
So you so, go you go into reservoir engineering two thousand eight, uh, right? You know, at the the beginning of the shale boom. Mm -hmm. I imagine you were probably working in conventionals. I was at, at the time. time. Yeah. yeah, I worked conventionals for yeah. quite some time. Actually, yeah. even through some of the shale boom, although got much more into looking at the unconventional space starting in about fourteen or so. Yeah, and I've been in that since. Yeah. So so tell me about. Um, you know, I think it's pretty interesting. You have a degree in chemical engineering. You went into the reservoir side. Then, obviously, there was an intersection of uh, knowledge and experience there where you're using um, chemicals to enhance recovery from the reservoir. Yeah. So yeah. Um, tell us about how you started kind of thinking about the problem and the solution. Yeah, so... Um... <sighs> What I have come, there there are a number of good chemical companies out there, right? But what I had come to realize, I think, is that the the disconnect between here's what this chemical does in the reservoir or even down in maybe in the propin or something, and the and then actually going out in the field and designing how you were gonna pump it and get it to where it needs to go was I, I think that was a big disconnect. So one of the things we're really focused on is um yeah, we've got a, a good back end lab that's doing the I think all the right stuff with the chemistry, but we're we're spending a lot of time on how do we design these, um, how do we get the stuff where it needs to go, right? And that's a big problem in horizontal. So right? let, yeah, let's dive into that a bit because um, I used to run expandable casing and back around uh, 2015 timeframe, there a lot of people were looking at refracts. Mm -hmm. And the traditional way of doing it was pumping cement and trying to plug existing perforations and then go in and um, uh, reperf. And the problem that you always had was your cement would go into the perfs right outside of the heel. You can never deliver down into the uh, lateral. And so that's where expandable casing came in. We could go into the lateral and isolate those perfs, but actually being able to deliver um, fluid to the perfs that you needed to get to mm -hmm. but it's always a challenge mm -hmm. so let's dive into that a bit and tell me how you guys think about that because like to your point it's like hey look you can have this solution and even back in refrax i mean people were coming out with these chemical solutions these resins and things of that nature where you know they're saying hey this can this works better than cement sure but, so the problem was is you couldn't get it to the, the purse that you needed yeah, to get it to yeah. so let's uh dive into that a bit so um, the diversion, there are different diversion packages out there, but, you know, generally we're wanting to use, you know, uh, as we said earlier, right? I mean, the best way ultimately would be if you could run coil in and spot every single perforation, right? It's expensive. That would be remarkably expensive, right? Yeah. Um, so the, what we have to figure out and continue to um, innovate in is in the, uh, either particulate diverters um, that are biodegradable. Um, so that's a lot of what we use today. They fit into the temperature what, profiles. What is that? What is a particulate diverter? So you can think of it, it's a specific chemistry, but you, um, you can think of it as uh, beads. So that would be roughly, so in, in sand sizes, it would be like 5-8 mesh, right, if, on, the, mm -hmm. on the high side. But then you have a wide range. So you want, you go from that down to like, 150, 200 mesh. Okay. Come, because um, if you think about a, because you're ultimately plugging up against the sand face, against the propin, yeah. right? So yeah. when you think about, you get those big, uh, I've heard it described as like jamming and plugging. So you get those big beads in there hitting that sand face and then all those little, littler ones, little faces in, in between and, and so on and so forth, right? Yeah. Um, so that is. So, so the idea here is that you're pumping a bigger bead that can sit against the uh, the sand face. Yeah. Okay. The propin face. Yeah, the propin face. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, so, it, yeah, that kind of sits there, and then it just everything kind of agglomerates, if you will, onto that yeah. uh, propin face, and then um, fluid starts to get diverted to another area. Okay. Yep. How does that um, – sorry, I'm, I'm thinking down hole here. Yeah. Um, so is the idea there that – with a uh, particulate diverter like this that 
okay, if it pumps into the perforations and the heel of the well, it sticks, and then the fluid is able to move down the lateral to the next? Correct. Is that, yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. Yep. That makes sense. Yep. Does that work? So far, we've seen pretty good results. I mean, what we're... Uh, <laughs> so if I understand this correctly, do you so you put the the particulate diverter kind yeah. of first to block off certain areas, and then you pump in the chemicals to a different area, um, or is it all one? No. So think about multiple stages. So okay, yeah. you know, we start pumping the fluid with the chemistry, right? Then we'll drop diverter, and then we'll do another stage. We'll drop diverter again. Um, so so we'll do that multiple times okay. throughout one job. Got you. Yeah. Got you. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very simple, basic question of does it work? But, you know, one that gets to the point. I mean, I'm just. So what we've, how we're evaluating thus far, right, is looking at pressure responses, right? So you can you can drop these things and say, okay, do we see pressure go up, right? Because you're injecting at some level pressure mm -hmm. and then we drop it and then we see the pressure rises. So by that rising, meaning it's going to the next least or next most conductive path yeah. right so yeah you're that's how we're evaluating it so far yeah um we're looking for anyone that has a fiber <laughs> that yeah. wants to do this right now so we haven't had that opportunity yet but yeah uh anyone's got these fiber wills so that'll give um, us some better insight so tell me a little bit about y'all's technology and, and the chemistry i mean it is Y'all secret sauce and the chemistry itself. Mm -hmm. And um, forgive me for my ignorance, um, you know, asking in, in these questions around the diverters, but is y'all secret sauce in the diverter process or is it in the chemicals uh, process? You know, what's actually increasing production and all that is the chemistry, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so that's where a lot of the, I think the, the secret sauce is. Yeah. Um, and so... It's uh, it tends to be heavy on the, in this refractant space, um, but you have different you know different stuff. You know, we even use solvents. Um, we even use traditional acids sometimes, right? Yeah. Part of it is just accessing. So part of it is you know using the diversion and doing the process, how we're designing them, the volumes we're doing, all that kind of coming together. Mm -hmm. um, but surfactants is a heavy piece of it. Yeah. And so because you said that you guys on back end also have a lab mm -hmm. as well. So I mean, I'm assuming. I don't have any experience in the in the chemical space, so um, I'm assuming that you guys, it, it's every reservoir is different, right? Every well bore is different, so I'm sure there's a very big bespoke element of what y'all do to put together the right uh, chemistry plan for each individual asset. Correct. Yeah. So we'll get um, like we'll get fluid samples in, so you get your oil, your water in, get uh, cuttings if you can. Um, and we'll work up, uh, uh, we've got a, a effective lab process we go through, yeah. uh, to, uh, qualify and, uh, different chemistries, make sure they're working, seeing the increased production from in the lab. Yeah. Um, and so there's certain mechanisms, right. We're going after, um, and so we're testing for those in the lab. Um, and then we make the, the recommendation back to the, to the client. Do you think your experience in reservoir engineering at a, um, you know, applicable level that you're working in reservoir engineering, do you think that gives you unique insight insight compared to coming out of school just as a chemical engineer trying to make chemical solutions? Well, it was critical, right? I mean, to go in and be able to study reservoir um, and go through all that was, was you know, invaluable. Um, I mean, I do tell a lot of petroleum engineers they only have one unique equation. It was Darcy's law. So uh, <laughs> everything else is chemical. So, yeah. uh, you know, so. I love the infighting between the uh, <laughs> engineering disciplines, engineers versus geologists. Yeah. yeah. So I'll do uh, anything that I can to stir, stir, stir a little that bit of pot fight. up yeah. for sure. For sure. Um, but, you know, it was critical, right? I mean, I got to kind of see how you evaluate. Uh, um, to some extent, you know, looking at the reserve side and, and just um, and then uh, but really getting deeper into flow through rock, right, flow through porous media. And how does that work and what are the mechanisms we can alter to improve that with? And then ultimately it came back to chemistry, right? What can we do to try and alter some of that with chemistry? This, so was, was this chemistry something that you just stumbled upon or was this something that you set out to develop? Was this something that you 
We somebody had already patented it, and you were like, "Hey, let's commercialize this." Or you just do better. You just do a better job than other people. Um, it's not patented. No, we developed it in that we didn't invent the molecules necessarily, yeah. right? But we have sourced different types of chemistry. We know, uh, or, you know, we know works mm -hmm. and blended it together into a specific formulations, different formulations. Yeah. So that's a lot of what chemistry <clears throat> ultimately is, right? It's not. Uh, we're not necessarily inventing new molecules um, mm -hmm. yet, but um, our yeah. focus is more on getting the right formulation put together. Yeah, you get yeah. the right the right concoction out of the yeah. lab, just yeah. sitting there cooking in the lab. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of so, like Walter White and Breaking Bad. It like, is, it's exactly. We didn't invent meth, we just invented the best meth. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, so tell me, um, did you, did I hear this right, that you guys started the business 2020 uh, timeframe? Yeah, right? late, kind of late 2020. So. so what was the catalyst for s starting this and going out on your own and um, creating a business? Yeah, I left my, uh, uh, left kind of the corporate world right before COVID. So, um, and wasn't quite sure what I was going to do. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, and then, uh COVID, well, and then effectively COVID hit. So I took that summer to kind of really think through different opportunities, what I saw on the market, um, and uh, got uh, uh, ended up linking up with the two of the co-founders. And um, we... How'd you link up with them? So one guy's a past colleague of mine from way back. Um, and... Um, the other guy's actually, uh, he's the owner of a company called Phenoric, uh, and they're a chemical manufacturer, in the, okay. primarily in the oil field space. So okay. he, um, he uh, both of them entrepreneurs, right? He started that company from nothing. Um, and uh, we, we started talking, and um, he had a lot of the stuff, you know, a lot of the pots and pans uh, that you need, like manufacturing wise, for some of this stuff, some yeah. of the chemistry. Yeah. Um, and so, because yeah, the stuff, I mean, takes full on labs. To, yeah. To, right. To experiment with and yeah. to manufacture. So he said, I love the idea, right? Let's do this. Um, and I guess in some way, they're like our, you know, in some way, they're the PE backer, right? Without actually being a backer, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. He said, we got resources. Let's do this. We can fill, you know, so. Um, was that a long process of like selling them on this, this kind of vision? No, not really. <laughs> yeah, they were in. It was easy. They were they were in. In. Anybody they were can start a chemical company. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, you get it. Um, they were in in that. I think we were in because we, uh, they saw, at least the owner, he saw, he said, I, I think I can use, utilize my equipment better, my plants better. Mm -hmm. And, um. And then, you know, I was like, well, that's great, right? Because I can just source it from there. And then, um, and then he's, and then the other piece to that was now we have this really, um, market facing operation, getting stuff into wells, right? Getting that, uh, getting both names out in front of, uh, you know, in front of the market more effectively. So. Yeah. I think that's actually a really interesting talking point because, uh, what you brought up, you know, essentially there are PE backer, um, we have a lot of people that listen to the show that aspire to build their own businesses and I always tell people there's a million different ways mm -hmm. to skin the cat. Right. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to go raise VC or private equity. Um, in this case, it's like, Hey, we found a partner that, uh, has a lot of sunk cost in manufacturing and laboratory equipment, thought it could be better utilized. Um, we were able to sell them on us as the partners mm -hmm. to, uh, uh, carry out this vision and you're able to leverage um, this existing manufacturing business and what they had um, to get off the ground. And that's very creative deal structure yep. to get a business started. And yep. so, um, you know, that's not a trivial talking point in my mind because sometimes you have to get creative in the ways that you start businesses. So, that's pretty cool to hear that. Yeah, no, it was a, it, I mean, it's worked out great right there. Uh, um, but yeah, it was, I look back at it, it's probably a little unique, I guess, on how we did it. But yeah. um, he's pretty, uh, you know, they're, both of them are great. So they're yeah. really help bring everything along. And then you brought up that you left the corporate world and um, 
then needed to figure out <laughs> what you're going to work on. I mean, that resonates with me when I quit my job, I didn't know what I was going to do. And, um, you just start evaluating opportunities. Um, what made you want to quit your job? I mean, did you realize that <laughs> it just um, wasn't what you're passionate about in life? You yeah. want to build businesses? Like, well, tell they, me about that a little bit. There was a lot going on with that company. So they were wanting me to move. They were wanting me uh, to take a different role. Um, I knew they were they were going through a ton of changes as well with um, spinoffs and business yeah. changes and all this stuff. So I looked at it and I said, I don't know if I, I don't really want that role. And I could move my whole family and then be, and then get concerned about a layoff, you know, and, and, um, and so we, I mean, it was pretty amicable and we left them pretty good terms and yeah. they, uh, uh, they're, they're very nice about it. Very generous about it and put it that way. Yeah. And but you still decided to stay in Denver, huh? Well, over, <laughs> so I decided to go to Denver over Sugar Land. Yeah, we uh, uh, we've just been dunking on Denver all week because we've had like we're recording for zero right now. Unless you're flying in from Denver, and we're just like, unless yeah. you're skiing or snowboarding, we don't. Well, so here's get it. so because I hate no, Denver. I know. I don't hate Denver. It's just like I'm very food motivated, and Houston's <laughs> food scene, I bar agree. none. I mean, crushes Denver, and I'm like. Yeah, we don't have mountains, but we got great food. Tell us a little bit about um, the progression of the business and growing the business. Mm -hmm. I mean, you start a business in oil and gas around 2020 time frame. Um, it's hard time to start a business um, in the industry, but also I believe it's the right time to start businesses in the industry. I believe the best businesses are built in the downturns um tell us what it was like in the early stages you know what challenges have you faced as an operator um you know trying to build relationships with companies mm -hmm. trying to get into wells um expand on that a little bit you know what have been what have been the challenges yeah so um we were uh let's see it took us it took us a while, but we were fortunate with our you know we had a relationship with um, a company uh, with a, uh, a I guess an executive at a company in in the Eagleford, and so um, they gave us that kind of first opportunity, right, to prove it out, um, and um, and so that was a big one for us. We ended up being pretty successful that that cool. treatment. Um, so that got us running, right? Um, kind of showed that you know we weren't totally full of shit, right? So. <laughs> Um, that's step one, step one, right? <laughs> Prove that we're not full of shit. Yeah. So, um, and then, you know, from there we kept, we, uh, expanded there. Um, and I have been pleasantly surprised at least with some of the majors. Cause I thought that would take a long time for some of them to ever, you know, to ever really move, but they've actually been, um, pretty except, you know, amenable and are actually some of our larger customers today. So, Interesting. That could be, I mean, part of it was, I mean, you guys have seen the, how, the, how the privates have drilled so much through this period and, and everyone else is relatively constrained. So yeah, um, I think in part that's what's going on is that there is some more dollars available for lower cost, um, high return or, or fat rapid return type projects on production. So um, yeah, but it's still, I mean, still very early for us, right? We were in it for just over a year, right? So, but yeah. Um, but we've been able to do stuff in, let's see, we're in six different basins now. We've done wells um, nice. in that period of time. What does that look like, being in six different basins when you're a chemical company? I mean, do you have to have yards in each one of those basins to get product out there? I mean, what does that look like? Does it work better in certain basins? Um, that's to be determined. I, I don't yeah. have that answer yet. Yeah. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, so I don't know. I don't know yet. That's overrode my question. <laughs> do you have yards? <laughs> so um, we do not yet. Um, we well, we're leveraging our our Fenork partners, right? So they have some. They have a big Midland yard in one in Houston, right? So yeah. Um, so pretty much they, able to ship out of. So we're able to ship yards. some stuff out of that, but for now, it's okay to just do it well by well. So we ship to each well site right so cool. um you know and free i mean everything's expensive but it's not the end of the world to ship from whatever houston to oklahoma right or to colorado you know so yeah. 
for now. Yeah. But yeah, uh, that's I didn't I didn't know if um you know that's something and and chemicals that's like you need red like have on demand availability within our proximity of assets sure. or if it was able I mean I'll let him venture we ship our pipe all over the world from <laughs> from Houston um and that was never never a problem so, so you guys just do you guys come in and like do one job or is it come in and like do a job every two three six months whatever oh well that's the the ultimate goal is we're on campaigns right so mm -hmm. we're starting to commercialize and do that in the eagleford um but the the ultimate goal right is that you'll have some some campaign like you would with a frac frac program right mm -hmm. so um so that's that's where the uh you know that's where we see it going um and so you've you know, you have your however many wells per year as an operator you're going to do. And then we, you know, campaign those throughout the year. Um, yeah. So that's where you may, you know, that's where we <clears throat> would look at being more efficient with supply chain. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. but some, you know, some different types of applications of chemistry, right? You have to be local, but this one's not quite as on demand. Yeah. Got you. Um, yeah. You talk about doing those campaigns. So, I mean, essentially, is this a thing that is you know, every 12 to 18 months, you're doing a, another work over and pumping, pumping this down because it sounds like, I mean, it's pretty, it doesn't take a lot to actually do it in terms of, um, services. It's not like you got to get, uh, a rig out there right. or anything, you know, you're just getting a couple of pumps out there and, um, pumping it down. So it seems like it's not a huge burden to actually run it, but, mm -hmm. Do you think that there's going to be benefit to running it on a cadence, whether it's 12 months, 18 months, whatever it is? Like on the same well? Yeah, like on the same well. Yeah, I think there's potential there. Um, we, I expect that the, the first wave of stuff will be, you know, much more focused on um, multiple, multiple wells and different types of wells so that you continue to hone in the, the best candidates. Yeah. Um, but I, I do see that as a potential. The other thing we've seen a lot of demand um, for is um, what we're calling, we, we call frack hit remediation, but wells that are taking hits um, and have lost production. And so you see a lot yeah. of those 18, 19 vintage wells out there. Yeah. That took those hits. And it had um, 150 foot spacing or whatever. Well, yeah, well, some of them were <laughs> stupid. Yeah, some stupid say things going on. But um, but even wells at, you know, 750 or whatever, and yeah. you, know, you put 20 some million pounds into that, well, you still take a hit. So, yeah. Um, and we see on those that, it's interesting, we've seen a lot of these where the, the well, uh, the, the gas to oil ratio, so your GOR is just like knocked down and doesn't recover. And then your water cuts stay high for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And so, um, those are great candidates we've seen for yeah. what we can do. Um, so we've I mean, seen different candidates. We're really trying to, to really focus on candidate selection. Yeah, I mean, the more data you collect, the smarter you get over time, right? Um, but one it's- the, One of the trends that we've seen in this space, particularly thinking about all the people who've done other EOR chemical stuff, is that they'll also go out and buy a lot of assets and do them for themselves. I'm kind of curious, is that something that you guys are looking at or are you just gonna stay pure play and focus on what, you're, what you got in front of you? Buy a lot of what? So just you buy a lot of assets themselves. <laughs> Oh, assets. Yeah. Um, Seeing people that take their technologies and utilize them for themselves. I don't know the answer to that one yet. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to be I'm, an oil man? Yeah. <laughs> I've been a pro, uh, yeah. We've had some discussions, but the uh, it's a great way to lose a lot of money. It's a great way to lose a lot of money because um, yeah, I mean, I would. It, it would be a different. It's a different business, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's totally different. It's a totally different business. So. Do you lose my only concern with that is sure I can go do that probably makes probably make some money but you definitely have to have a management team that knows how to run an asset you lose right focus and, and then yeah. do you lose a lot of focus on yeah. building the technology yeah yep. right yeah so that's my that's always been my being able to stay focused is a super superpower so yeah um, definitely agree with that sentiment yeah the uh, I mean the space is really intriguing um, I mean I'm sure everyone's listening. Most of the people listening to the show are familiar, but you know, people outside the industry probably don't know, but just how much oil and gas gets left in the ground. Um, I mean, we just recover such a little amount mm -hmm. of the uh total reserves. Do you know what that average stat is? So well, for shale, 
mean, there's arguments, right? But you're probably getting eight to ten percent, maybe. Yeah. You only recover eight to ten percent. Yeah, something like that yeah. for shale. That's, I mean, conventionals I con- are more like thirty percent. I constantly but. hear in shale that it's eighty to ninety percent. Is I mean, I'm sure there's arguments and discrepancies, but I mean, I consistently hear that. It's just towards the future. It's just wild to think about that. That's how much we leave down there. And we're looking at it as the, because there's a next step beyond what we're doing, which are much larger EOR treatments, we call them, right? And so that could be large gas injection, um, could be really large chemical injection. Um, I don't, I haven't seen the industry ready for that yet. So we're looking at this kind of this bridge piece and saying, we think one, we may not get as much oil out as those really, really large ones are, but there's, the, but we also think what we're doing is much more economic, right? So yeah. the returns are better, they're quicker. Um, That's so, why you have to look at point of diminishing returns mm-hmm. as well, right? It's like, okay, if this technology can be deployed uh, quickly and cheaply and it'll return X amount, I mean, that ends low risk, yeah. um, there's a lot of variables and factors that, sure. that go into it so it's usually best to attack low hanging fruit yeah, yeah exactly so yeah yeah so you can spend a little money get 30 to 50 percent more production i mean that's kind of what we're seeing so um, yeah and squeeze another 10 or 20 percent out of that well i mean that was always an issue with expandable casing and refracts you know going back to what i was talking about was you know you had this issue okay well we can get true isolation on perforations on each set of perforations if we run expandable casing expandable casing is a hundred dollars a foot it's not it's not cheap yeah. right and so okay well we spend uh hundreds of thousands of dollars to reline a well bore and then refract on top of that how much are you actually recovering and so even though that yeah there's a better process is it economic and at the end of the day economics <laughs> yes <laughs> they drive everything right yes so or at least they should yeah, yeah. at least they should yeah <laughs> yeah like, let's put an asterisk they they should they don't always <laughs> they got a long enough time time horizon right. they always do but there's right. some pretty uh squirrely stuff that happens in the in Indeed. the inner rim Indeed. But, um so you know as, as you guys are uh you know sounds like you're still in the early stages but mm-hmm. building building up you told me that uh you know, you actually met with the candidate on in sales and your trip here uh, to Houston. Sounds like you guys are looking at hiring. You yeah. know, what do you see as the next six six months to 12 months? I mean, it's a great time in the business right now. We have tailwinds, um, which is nice for yep. a change. Um, I think that people like you and I know that, <laughs> that they can change uh, just, just, Any as, day, yeah, you know. just, just as quick as it uh, uh, changed post-2020. But what y'all's focus over the next six to 12 months as the operators? So, um, yeah, so we have, we are hiring them a little bit uh, to help drive sales. Um, it, it's, or, you know, expansion growth mode at this point. So yeah. we've got a good base of case studies um, and it's, and now it's a matter of just getting it out uh, in front of, you know, target customers and just putting market those plans together. At this point. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that is our that's our target for this year, cool. um, and uh, we see see a lot of opportunities. Especially, you know, it's interesting, especially in the actually uh, the Permian will be there, and and it's going to be huge, obviously for for us and, and everybody. Yeah, but we see a lot of demand in some of these other basins like Eagle for DJ and Bakken, where they're a little more mature, and so and they're running out of it. Running out of inventory, not quite, but they're less inventory than you would in the Permian, right? Yeah, I mean, Bakken has very little top tier acreage to drill, mm-hmm. right? So, so, what can you do there? Yeah. So you, you see that pull there, right? So, yeah. um, so that's always that's been an interesting trend. Yeah, very much. Um, so we have a lot of uh, production engineers, reservoir engineers that listen to this show. If they want to find you guys, you have a website, you know, on LinkedIn. How do they find you? Yeah, so we got a website, kairosenergyservices.com uh, on LinkedIn, Mike Lance, uh, Twitter, Mike Lance. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember a handle is. I went, I went from anonymous to non-anonymous at some point. Oh, I love so, it. I love it. Cool. Uh, well, we'll, uh, we'll drop a link to uh, Mike's Twitter. We need more Twitter plugs. Like People don't, they usually come out and say, plugs. find me on Twitter. Like, that's, that's where you need to find them. Turns out Mike's Kenny Lay. 
So (laughs) (laughs) for sure. I am not that (laughs) way. So if you guys uh want to reach out, get more information, uh hit up Mike over on Twitter or uh go to Kairos Energy Services.com. All right, cool. Well, Mike, appreciate you coming on the show, man. Thanks, guys. Yep. Appreciate it.